Great. Hey everyone, I'm Lisa, also known as Nifty or Nifty and I. Um, this is a conference about layer twos. Um, I think layer twos are pretty cool. I've been working on Lightning for a couple of years now, um, but I find, I don't know, I think Bitcoin is like one of the, I think Bitcoin as a protocol has some of the most interesting, novel, and new um, kind of protocol development happening around layer twos. And so what I kind of want to do is like sort of talk through my theory of layer two, I think there's a couple, um, and kind of just go into like, what is a layer two? What does it mean to be layer two? Um, how can we, what, what are some things that maybe we could use as like a grading rubric to compare layer twos? Okay, so I think I might, hmm, yeah, I'm just gonna look at this. Great, I don't have to type, this is great. Okay, um, so let's start with kind of an obvious question. What is a layer two? You guys read this, right? This is like fine. Okay, cool, I'm gonna keep doing this then. Okay, so generally speaking, um, I like to say that a layer two is an accounting system that lets you transact with a layer one asset independent of the native layer one accounting system. Not projecting? I can. Okay, okay. Uh, here, let me do. My, wait, I don't know if I can actually. Nope, that's not gonna work. Okay, cool. We're just gonna. Okay, okay, cool. Started? Um, okay, so in Bitcoin, okay, so what is a layer? So I'm talking about accounting systems. What does it mean to talk about an accounting system? So let's talk about like the Bitcoin layer one accounting system. In a Bitcoin layer one is a blockchain, right? That means that when there's transactions or when you want to make changes in who owns money, you write them into blocks, right? So the place where transactions live and where, block, where transactions are recorded is inside of a block. One way of kind of thinking about this is like a batch processing, it's like a batch processing system. So you make a bunch of transactions, you package them up into a block. That then becomes like a batch state update for the chain of who owns what gets changed, right? Every block. And it's with the block that you write in who's got how much money and who has, who had how much money and who has it now, right? So we keep track of who has what money in blocks inside of transactions. Right? So it's got an accounting system, which is a blockchain, and that's, that becomes layer one, right? And so the asset that we're talking about in both layer ones and layer twos is going to be these numbers that are written into this ledger that's in the blocks that we call Bitcoin, right? So layer one is actually an accounting system, um, and it just helps us keep track of who owns what money, or who owns how much Bitcoin, really. Okay, so when we start talking about a layer two, Suddenly, we're going to use some other system for doing accounting. So, what does that mean? Like, what is another system? Um, right. What is an accounting system? Quick aside. Great. Okay. So, really, like, if you think of an accounting system, really, it's like a it's a way of tracking who owns how much and keeping a record of it, right? So, at any point in time, you can kind of know how much of a certain thing you own, right? And there's like a lot of different ways that you can do this. I think is kind of the point of all these layer twos that we're going to talk about. Um, the way that, that Bitcoin, like a blockchain does it, is by writing transactions into batches called blocks. Um, there's other ways that we can keep track of who owns how much that don't involve like writing things into blocks. And that's kind of where layer twos come in. So you're going to have a different accounting system that, that's not the original layer one one. And that's all that kind of makes, that's kind of all that makes it a layer two. Okay, so here's some common examples that you might have heard of as layer twos. And all of these have, I think for the most part, different accounting mechanisms. They're keeping track of who owns what Bitcoin in like a separate system. So um, common examples would be like Lightning, which is used payment channels, Fediments, uh, which use East Cash tokens, Liquid Sidechain, oh, I'll get to this in a second. Liquid Sidechain uses a whole nother blockchain, right? So they use the second blockchain which is different than the first one, but still separate like accounting system, right? Um, There's some proposals to do other kinds of layer twos, like space chains, state chains, roll-ups. And then on Ethereum, you can even say like, you can take the same kind of um, understanding of layer twos and look at other chains such as ETH, um, where they also have separate accounting systems that are layer twos. These are things like Optimism, Arbitrum, and Aztec, et cetera. Cool. Okay, so this is like the layer two idea is not just Bitcoin specific. I just think that like Bitcoin 
legitimately has the most novel number of protocols that are being developed and novel ways of doing accounting around it, um, cool. So like I was kind of mentioning earlier, so what accounting systems do each of these different layer two proposals use? In Lightning, you use cash layer one transactions. In Fediment, you use something called Xiaomi and tokens. Uh, Liquid Federation, whole second blockchain. Rollups is a question mark thing. They basically use, um, well, this is complicated. I don't know how to explain it simply, so I'm just gonna hand wave over it. Um, they use, uh, state and space chains use, I think also use cash layer one transactions, so it's like similar lightning in that way. And then these rollups generally kind of use a whole separate blockchain to do all their accounting in. Okay, so we have like different places that we're keeping track of who owns what, and it's not the Bitcoin blockchain is like the big idea around what a layer two is, I think. Okay, cool. Okay, so every once in a while, I'll like tell people this, and I'll get a wise guy who asks me, all right, Lisa, what about Coinbase? According to this definition, aren't they also a layer two, right? Okay, so why would that be a good question? Does anyone have, okay, yeah. Because they're using an accounting model other than Bitcoin to keep that your points. Right, so the, uh, Super test that says it's because we're using an accounting model other than Bitcoin to keep track of coins. Okay, so where are they keeping track of it? They use a database, right? So they give you, so when you take your Bitcoin from on-chain and you deposit it into a Coinbase account, then they give you an entry in their database and they say, hey, Lisa owns like, I don't know, one Bitcoin on Coinbase, right? So then inside their accounting system, I have a Bitcoin. And if I wanted to send that Bitcoin in their accounting system, which is a database, right, that they can just change when they want to, um, is if I wanted to like move money from my account to somewhere else, I would tell them and then they would just move it in their database. They, in their database, they would subtract the Bitcoin from my account and add it to like maybe my friend Alice's account, right? And so in order to transact with Bitcoin in the Coinbase database, you don't have to touch the blockchain. They can just make an update in their personal accounting system, right? So that seems like it seems like a layer two, right? Like that seems like it would qualify. Um, great. So I'm gonna add, so I don't think that's a layer two. How many of you think that counts as like a layer two? Should that count as a layer two? Being able to just have a database and keep track of it. It's a separate accounting system. You're transacting with uh, the layer one asset, right? You're, you're keeping track of who owns what Bitcoin. You're just doing it in a database. I, I, think, I think this is unsatisfactory. I think that there's something a little bit more um, wow, that's a lot of text, okay. Um, <laughs> I think that there's, oh no, okay, okay, sorry. Um, I think there's like something a little bit more to layer twos than this separate accounting system, right? So um, I think I wanna, I think, I think the thing that I would add to that, sorry, I'm just going through a lot of text, it's called unsatisfactory because um, I think, I think I would add that it's a separate accounting system where the authorization to execute a transaction in that separate system has to be granted by the original of the account holder, if that makes sense. So what this means, so how is Coinbase not that? In Coinbase, if I have a database, anyone who has access to that database can update any of the entries in the database, right? So if I've got one Bitcoin in my account, who has permission to move the Bitcoin out of my account and put it to someone else's in the database? Anyone who has right access to that database, right? Um, so I think, and it, in contrast, when you look at something like the Liquid Network or a Lightning transaction or a Chalmian token, the difference is in order to take a Chalmian token and assign that value to change who owns it in the ledger, like to give those tokens to someone else in the cast of like an eCash token, I'm hand waving over how that works exactly, but um, in order to do that, you need the uh, you need a signature, right? You need authorization of the person who owns the token in order for it to be a valid transaction on that second layer. So I think that like the the, the key difference is that these layer two protocols require, for the most part, signatures from the person who owns the second layer object, like the second layer, like a you know a balance in a lightning channel. You have to get the signature of the person who owns that balance in order to change their balance on the system, right? So that would effectively rule out all of these Coinbase or any like any any accounting system where someone other than the account holder can change their balance on that system um, would not be considered, in my mind, a layer, like a proper layer two, right? Okay, so that's kind of 
Uh, this is my definition of layer two. Um, well, you have to have something that is authorized by the end user. So in that way, it kind of makes a layer two such that it's not your keys, not your coins, right? So like layer twos, you are to some extent able to hold the coins to the layer two asset, kind of hand waving over the Bitcoin is. I don't think we're going to get into that too much. Um, but yeah. Yeah, you call uh, Decentralized exchange? I think that would count, yes. Because you hold the keys, right? Yeah, and you can't move the assets unless someone with a key holder moves it. I think that counts as layer two. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, okay. So I think that solves that. I think, all right, cool. Yeah, layer twos have to be able to get accounts to change it. Cool. And the asset that you're transacting with is an asset that like originates in another accounting layer, right? Um, so the fundamental unit of account in the second accounting layer is strongly tied and like issued in a different asset layer, like a different accounting system, kind of. Okay, the like pictures might be more helpful, but we don't have those new text. Great, okay. Um, cool, so we could go a little bit more into how layer two is related to layer one. So like where does the authority to transact on layer one assets come from? So what gives us the ability to take a layer one asset move it into a second accounting system and say, okay, this is really Bitcoin, right? Like, how is it that, like, in an eCash system, you can have a, a eCash token and say, this is a Bitcoin transaction when I give it to you, right? Because I feel like people say that. They're like, okay, we're transacting with Bitcoin when we transact with eCash, right? This is a Bitcoin equivalent object, a Bitcoin equivalent um, accounting number or whatever. Um, like, I'm giving you stats when I, like, pay you with Lightning. Right? For example, like I'm giving you Bitcoin securities. Where does that authority to say this is Bitcoin? Because it's not happening in the first layer. Like, how do you know that it's actually Bitcoin in layer two? Um, so my my answer to this question is that um, you have to lock up that asset in layer one. So you kind of have to take it so like it would, you could transact with it on layer one. But if you want to transact with it in any of these particular layer two systems, you have to take the equivalent amount of asset on layer one and lock it up into like kind of a special box. Usually that special box kind of belongs to that layer two protocol in a certain way. And once you put it in that box, you're saying, okay, I'm taking this asset, I'm reserving it out of the transaction system for layer one. And the accounting sense on layer one, it's like kind of in a special shared account or whatever. And now you're saying, okay, any of the Bitcoin in this special shared account on layer one, I'm now going to use the second accounting system to keep track of who owns it, right? So you move kind of the who's keeping track of the ownership of that Bitcoin in that like shared account up to a separate system. And that's how you can scale Bitcoin transactions by having Bitcoin um, that's been kind of set aside or reserved for accounting that happens somewhere else. And so hopefully the idea of layer two, right, is that in the layer two accounting system, you can make more transactions more quickly amongst more people using this Bitcoin that's accounted for on the main chain um, in such a way that it like, can go a lot faster, right? So you're much able, you're much more able to transact with Bitcoin much faster because you're no longer waiting for these batch transactions to happen on the layer one. So it's kind of like the whole goal, right? And this is why we do layer twos is so that you can kind of get faster transactions happening on a subset of Bitcoin. One also thing, another thing, hopefully I'm like not too terribly off my notes, but I'm gonna take the tabbing. Um, typically the way that you do this is a multi-sig contract. So you create a multi-sig kind of bucket on layer one. You deposit your Bitcoin into this bucket somewhere on layer one. And then um, once you've like proven that you've locked up your money into that bucket, they'll issue you kind of like shares that show that you've issued money on the, the layer two, right? So the new accounting system, you'll get credit because you've locked up money into that, whatever the shared bucket is. And they're all different depending on what layer two. All the layer twos have kind of different ways of doing how you lock up the layer one asset. Um, but that like locking it up and then kind of getting a credit in the second system is pretty universal, so sort of. yeah. Um, there's another point I wanted to make, which I've now totally forgotten, but that's fine. Okay, so, Example of liquid, so an example is like, so Liquid Network is one of the first, wasn't the first, but it's one of the first side chains that got issued, that got created for Bitcoin. Um, and the way that it worked is there's a multi-sig that's held by a federation of companies and kind of users. So it's like a, I don't know, used to be, I think they've changed it now, I don't, I don't really kept up with it, but it used to be like a 11 of 15 multi-sig. And so you would send your money to this federation um, who's got 
decentralized, like they're on different continents, they all run separate keys, their keys are in totally different places, they're different organizations. You lock your money up into this like account that's managed by this very disparate set of people. And then in exchange, as soon as you've proven, they call it a peg in, as soon as you've proven that you've locked funds into this multi-sig that's owned by the Federation, they would issue you liquid Bitcoin credits on this second blockchain. So then you would have liquid Bitcoin, and you could trade it a lot faster because blocks on liquid happen every minute. Uh, I think it's two minute finality on liquid. Um, it's cheaper because not as many people are using it. It's more confidential because that blockchain uses bulletproofs to hide amounts and assets that are being exchanged. Um, so you kind of get new features on being able to transact um, because you've locked up your Bitcoin in a multi-sig in layer one. Cool. Okay. See what else? Um, another thing that's very similar is like e cash mints. Um, so I don't know if Christian was talking about this beforehand. It's fine. Maybe it was right here. Anyways, um, like uh, the Fediment talks. Did you talk about Fediment? Or were you just talking about? So the lightning pin. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really here too. Um, okay, so the, um, the e cash mint, um, if you guys attended the Fediment thing or have seen the Fediment, those are federated e cash mints. They have the same kind of multi-sig thing as liquid for the most part, where you lock your money into a federated multi-sig. In exchange, they give you these like eCash token things. These eCash tokens aren't on a blockchain. They're just, like kind of like bearer assets, which means that you if you hold the ticket and you can sign for it, that is enough proof that you that it's yours. There's no central ledger where your name is written down or there's a number next to it, like in a blockchain. Um, so these, these eCash tokens then become your unit of account, right? So if you own 10 eCash tokens and you own 10 of the, that Bitcoin, whatever, and then if you want to use them to trade, you like create a signature for it, send it to the thing, and then the other person gets it. So you can trade them, you can use them. They're as good as Bitcoin. They, they're, they're equal to the amount of Bitcoin you put into the mint. Um, right, but it's just a different accounting system, right? Like that, these little like tokens that you trade is different than having a blockchain. And that's kind of the nice thing about this layer two design, right? So all these different layer twos are coming up with different ways of doing accounting um, for the same kind of thing. It's all about Bitcoin. Oh, that's the point. Um, so one thing that's kind of interesting about this is that across all the layer twos on Bitcoin, then there can never be more than 21 million Bitcoin, right? Um, so that means that you know these uh, layer twos, to some extent, are a little bit in competition with each other for how much Bitcoin are going to get locked up into them, right? Um, because you can only transact as much as the Bitcoin has been committed to them in Bitcoin on that layer. Unless someone figures out how to rehab application, which like we're not here to talk about, but that's fine. Or like you fractional reserve layer two banking. That's how you would get more. Anyways, Gossip yeah. Gossip V2. What? Gossip V2. Gossip V2. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's coming, TM. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't talk about that. Okay, forget I said that. It's fine. <laughs> Wipe from the record. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about why layer two. I think we talked about this, right? So now you can batch your Bitcoin and then transact a lot on the top of it. it makes it cheaper. More people can transact at the same time. Um, so it far exceeds the native capacity of the accounting layer on layer one. Like a layer one, you can only have so many transactions an hour. On a layer two, it lets you kind of like distribute the transactions across a lot of different accounting systems. And maybe these systems have like different throughput, so to speak, of how fast they can change the state or update the state for who owns the like object or the token on whatever platform it's on. And so that means lots of people can use Bitcoin at the same time all across the world in different places, and it's all Bitcoin and it's all kind of like the same thing, which is pretty cool. Cool. So also what makes like layer two interoperable, right? So if you have Bitmint tokens, you can exchange them for a lightning payment because it's all Bitcoin underneath, right? Everyone agrees that that's Bitcoin. So you can, there are two separate accounting systems, right? Like a federated mint is a, um, a federated mint is a separate accounting system from a um, on-chain thing, whatever. No, a lightning payment, which is channel payments. But it's, it's Bitcoin, you just have to trade who owns the asset in each account, right? So you kind of just trade for like the tokens for lightning payment, whatever, but it's all Bitcoin. So layer two is interoperable. I think I'm really running out of time. Um, I was gonna do three minutes, plenty of time. Yeah, I was gonna do a comparison. This always happens. I was gonna do a comparison of existing layer protocols to proposals. Um, maybe we'll just talk through the things that I would like or make this a little bit smaller. So maybe it'll fit. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, so I kind of made a list of things that, like, so you can look at like there's a couple of different proposals of how to do a layer two, and various states of being broadcast or like. 
proposed and made and actually existing. You know, like payment channels on Lightning have been around for like years now. Space chains just got some the project launch like last week, two yep. weeks ago, as a proposal on a Signet. Um, so it's cool though because these things are like, you know, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of stuff happening um, across a lot of different projects and ecosystems and they all have different trade-offs, right? So when you're deciding what layer two you want to maybe lock your Bitcoin into and use as your unit of account, it might be kind of nice to have like a rubric of things to think about and ask yourself when you're locking your Bitcoin up into them because they kind of have different feature sets to some extent. Okay. So here's kind of my like maybe list of things that I would probably want that might be interesting to know about it. Um, or like some of these are more like engineering style things. Okay, so the first one is the broadcast scope of state changes. So this means like if I make a transaction on this layer two, who needs to find out about it? So like on Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a global ledger. When you make a transaction on Bitcoin, everyone on Bitcoin finds out about it, right? That's global. It takes a long time, so it makes it Bitcoin slow. It's what makes it such that we can't do that many transaction updates that often. It's because everyone has to find out about it, and that has a cost associated with it. Um, we're on Lightning, depending on how many channels you're hopping through, it can be two to like 21 people, roughly, that need to find out about this changes about your things, right? So you go from everyone on Bitcoin, which could be millions of people, down to maybe 21 at the most. Minimum of two, right? Because when you make a payment on a lightning channel just between two people, only the two of you ever find out about that state of state. So you can kind of scope how many people need to find out about a transaction depending on the layer two thing. Okay, I'm really almost out of time now. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, liveness requirements means who needs to be available or participate for me to make a transaction. On the layer one, whenever you make a, a Bitcoin chain, like a blockchain, the a transaction for like layer one, depending on your multi-sig, let's just say it's a single sig, um, you only need one person to make a signature and then you need a miner to mine the transaction. So you need two kind of two parties, the person who wants to transact and the miner on the layer one. In the lightning channel, you need every person along that payment path to be available to make a signature in order for your payment to go through. So that could be up to 21 different people that need to sign in order for your lightning payment to be settled. Um, the other, like, I think the last liveness requirement would be, uh, no, what's another good example? Uh, like the eCash token, mint, maybe that might just be one person. I need to look at the protocols for eCash mint token things, but. I mean, T of M, it's, T of the M Federation members have to be online to get a signature. No, but that's, that's only when you're exiting. Like when you're actually with eCash token and you're like trying to. So like, when I give you eCash, you yeah. have to redeem the eCash from the right. base, so you need the signature from uh, the Okay, so it is. So it is actually, so you need like multiple, it's not just like one. Yeah, okay. T of M. T of M. So like. Five of eleven, five seven, something uh, like that. Seven of eleven, five of seven, and three of four. Okay, yeah. Cool. Seven of eleven did you remember? Stick with that. Right. Cool. So you have to have seven of eleven people who have to sign in order to transact on an eCash token, right? So this is a real, like, kind of important thing to know, right? How many people have to be in line for you to transact? Cool. Okay. Uh, cost of transaction, like how much am I going to have to pay to make this exchange, like to send this transaction on Lightning that's kind of done by volume, like around how many hops you're making, how much money you're sending, and how many people have to send it for you on like something like uh, Liquid, it's like you still pay a transaction fee, same as on the base layer, um, hopefully it's less than on the original one. Um, Rollups have kind of cool ways of doing cost of transactions because they're like fractions of all the transactions that have to happen in that block kind of thing. Um, Cool. Okay, so then you can figure out how much it's going to cost to transact on that and what it's a function of, so to speak. Because in Lightning, it's a function of how much volume of, of stacks you're sending. On um, something like Liquid, it's just like well, how big the transaction is. Um, I'm way over time. I keep going. Okay, granularity of transactions with the smallest transaction I can make on this accounting ledger. So on like the main chain, I think the minimum relay size is around 150 sats. Um, so if you have a payment that's small than 150 sats, you can't make that payment on the layer one. Um, I think the eCash tokens tend to be in denominations. I don't know what the denominations are. It probably depends on the mint. They get to decide what the bills that they're issuing are. So eCash tokens have bills. It could be a five dollar bill or five sats bill, a ten sats bill, a hundred sats bill. And if you want to transact, you have to have bills in the right denominations. Um, at Lightning, you can transact all the way down to a milli satoshi, which is a thousandth of a satoshi. So you can make true micropayments using Lightning channels, Lightning transactions. 
Um, again, this has to do because these are different accounting ledgers, right? So it's cool because with different accounting ledgers, we do transactions with different granularities, which is kind of interesting. Okay, last two points are probably some of the most important ones. Um, ruggability and exitability, which are kind of similar things. So ruggability means like, how possible is it for this layer two to rug me of my layer one asset? So whenever you have like these, remember I talked about you have like a shared account box on like the layer one that everyone puts their Bitcoin in, and then we all decide we're gonna transact on the layer two accounting system. Um, when, who's holding that box? Who has the keys to that box that I'm putting my Bitcoin into? Is it me? Do I have one of those boxes? Is it a federation member? Am I like giving it to a federation of people and I'm hoping that they are like a well-trusted, established unit of people that I can expect to be able to get my money out and not have them rug me? Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a good one. And then the exit ability is Kind of similar, it's similar to the ruggability, right? But it's who do I need to ask to get my tokens back? How do I ask to exit back to layer one? Um, do I need to get permission from the federation? Do I need to get permission from a channel peer? Do I need to get permission from a, like a miner? Well, I guess that's not that sort of thing. Um, a miner probably doesn't count. Um, all right, so how easy is it and what's the process to get my money out of that lockbox on the layer one back into on-chain layer one funds that I now own outright, right? No longer in the shared box. So to speak. And so basically, like you know, when you exit, they'll like delete your assets. Your assets on the layer two will no longer exist, right? They'll delete you out of the second accounting system and you go back to basically to being on the layer one accounting system with your tokens. So how do you get back out there? What's the process for that? What do I have to ask? Okay, I'm like five minutes over. That's my whole talk thing. Um, classes about Bitcoin and the protocol at Base 58. This week, hoping to get the website updated with some new classes. I'm planning on doing fingers crossed the Taproot class in June in Prague, maybe in New York City in June. Uh, hoping to get the first lightning class out in July in Nashville, so that'd be the second week of July if you're going. Um, yeah, but hopefully like follow our Twitter. I'll be like posting stuff as I update it. Hopefully we'll have stuff out by then next week. And sometimes I read things on the internet. I have a a uh, shitcoin blog on Substack called Chain Fail. Um, I have a uh, more software related thing, and then I'm working on a book this year on Bitcoin transactions, which maybe will come out. I don't know. Woo! Cool. Woo!